Um, well, it's 11 o'clock, and I like to start on time. This is the legacy of all of us being on Zoom for our entire lives, uh, I think. Um, uh, but uh, thank you all for coming in. Uh, and uh, uh, to, I guess this is the beginning of the supply chain security contract, uh, at least for the day, uh, here at uh, the Open Source Summit. How many of you were at OpenSSF Day yesterday? Okay, about half of you, good. Um, uh, and uh, how many of you write code for a living? I assume all of you do, right? Or, or okay, yeah, good. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so this is a talk that's about <clears throat> trying to figure out how we make uh, uh, the developer tools that we use today just more secure by default. Uh, this is a talk that uh, we plan to evolve quite a bit and, and, and really want to fill with more detailed uh, kind of examples over time. Uh, I'd like this to be a talk that actually any of you could give. <laughs> If you'd like to, because this this is, is really going to, I think, be a big focus for uh, the OpenSSF community going forward. Uh, I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm the CTO for the OpenSSF. I need to practice saying that because that's uh, recently announced as of yesterday. I've handed the general manager baton off to Omkar Arasaratnam, uh, uh, who many of you have perhaps met. Uh, and so I'm going to be diving into like more and more of these details over time. But I also know I'm probably speaking to a room where not only could all of you give a talk like this, you probably could even give some of the specific examples. So look at this like you might look at an early stage Wikipedia page. Uh, and I, I actually, maybe I should put this up in GitHub or something like that. Um, so I don't need to like tell you all that the world is in, uh, indeed on fire when it comes to security. In fact, there have been uh, kind of some famous conflagrations. Uh, I, uh, you know, log4j, yada, yada, yada. All of that. I don't need to scare you with kind of the current state of things. I think many of you also know that there are not just like the Big Bang kind of vulnerabilities that are out there, but a tremendous number of common, simple bugs that continue to be pervasive across the open source ecosystem. I, I, Jonathan Lightshow will probably kill me for giving the example of Trellix rather than one of his own campaigns, um, but uh, uh, it, they, they just have, they have such good numbers. So there's a company called Trellix that did a, uh, a scan for an old bug uh, in, uh, in, in uh, across the open source repositories, all the open source repositories they could scan on GitHub. And this old bug was uh, uh, has existed since 2000 and seven. Uh, this is a bug in a Python module for expanding out tar, tar files. Uh, I think it was, or zips. The tar files or zips. I think it was tar. Um, uh, that uh, if you did that from a root, you could over, and you did uh, it as root, you could overwrite the Etsy password file and other things like that, right? This is behavior that the Python developers decided not to fix because it's POSIX compliant to do that very thing. And they said, you have to be a secure user of this code. You have to know how you're invoking it, and it's up to the person invoking this library to keep it from doing bad things. That's kind of lame. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Trellix did a scan to see how many software packages out there uh, actually don't. Hey, Jonathan, I'm giving the Trellix uh, scan example. Uh, a nice, nice duck on your head. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, so they did a scan, and 61,000 uh, open source projects out there are vulnerable to this, this, this uh, insecure usage of this Python module. Um, and so they submitted not only issues to, to say, that, you know, here's these are this is a bug in your code you should go fix they submitted pull requests to go fix all that because they could automate the process like we're, like Jonathan has done with his research in not just detecting that vulnerability but coming up with the pull request that f closes that vulnerability right and it's a simple fix it's a really simple fix um, submitted 61,000 pull requests against uh, all these different repos and about 2,000 3,000 of them responded uh, and the other 60 odd thousand uh, uh, did not right um, are, are still vulnerable. Now, a lot of those will be one-off weekend kind of forks or projects, you know, student projects, those kinds of things that are, you know, not maintained anyways. It's kind of hard to calibrate for that. But the fact exists that, that across the open source landscape, there's a lot of these low-level bugs in addition to the deeper issues that we all know about. And, and again, I don't need to scare you about all the kind of news around software supply chain attacks. Uh, we had a great presentation yesterday at OpenSSF Day by Elizabeth Weiss about um, some of the typo squatting and uh, clone packages kind of attacks that are emerging in the NPM ecosystem, which they're trying to address, and I'll talk about a way that they're uh, addressing it in just a bit. Uh, but I, I, these things are becoming more and more pervasive. And and, um, and that is because open source software was largely devised and, and developed its tooling at a time of extremely high trust, where there was high trust in the link between uh, the, uh, the developers of code and the packages that they would put up for distribution, where, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, we just didn't develop the rigor and the, and the, and the kinds of paranoia 
that frankly we should have. And it reminds me a lot of the early days of the internet <laughs> when uh, m there was no TLS, when there was, uh, you know, when people kind of used PGP, but as you know, those are the weird ones, right? You know, the, the people who do that were the paranoids. The, all of the rest of us, you know, sent unencrypted email over bare SMTP like, like real people. Uh, and, and meanwhile, now we have to worry about that kind of thing. Now we have to encrypt our connections. In the software development world, uh, I, it used to be the case, and I'm an old FreeBSD user. Is anyone else here? Have you used FreeBSD? Okay, great. FreeBSD had this great system where you could always recompile the OS and recompile world, all of your packages, all of your dependencies from source locally there on the machine, right? And to install a new package, you could go get the binary package, but, you know, the, what real people did is you'd pull down the source, you know, and go to user ports and type the right directory and type make and then make install and suddenly it was there and you knew that all the dependencies were, were at least PGP verified and, and, and or GPG verified, and it was probably going to be secure enough, right? Um, uh, but these days, everybody builds from pre existing uh, binaries, right? Everyone bootstraps from a system image, a container image, a, uh, a collection of modules that they've pulled off of Maven Central, compiled, pre compiled, because nobody wants to sit around for 12 hours while everything recompiles, right? I understand that, I get that. But We've, in doing that, introduced the po prospect of a whole lot of vulnerabilities uh, in that exploit these default assumptions that we make uh, that the world is uh, safe underneath our feet. Um, another big change, of course, that has happened is that the world of packages is incredibly heterogeneous. Um, there, uh, and, and the world of software within any given repo varies tremendously and in ways that are challenging to determine between those software packages that are well maintained, that are frequently released, where uh, releases are signed off by other developers, uh, you know, or those packages that are maintained by a single person who kind of wrote it, threw it out there, and without really any marketing or effort or awareness, those packages ended up getting used thousands or hundreds of thousands of times and pulled down uh, hundreds of thousands of times a day. And so that's how you end up with packages like Colors.js or left, uh, left, uh, le uh, Shift Left, I forget, Left Tab, right? Uh, left Pad, thank you. Um, uh, and others that uh, became stories that were kind of drama filled. A developer felt that they were being taken advantage of, and maybe they were. You know, they're certainly overlooked uh, when people were thinking about where to invest, and they kind of got pissed and, and made a change that then broke a bunch of websites. Like, that's a supply chain attack. Now, we all might have sympathy for the developer, that's fine, but some of you probably had your builds broken in a way that you didn't expect, right? So, so the world of packages here is pretty, pretty uh, frustrating. And we can try to be better developers, we can try to be smarter, we can try to like go and look at all the social dynamics behind every package we, we include, but that's not scalable. It was okay when at the level of the Apache web server, including a few uh, libraries and the standard lib and everything like that, but it does doesn't scale out when you have applications that are consuming thousands of dependencies like some of them out, do out there today. So by embedding security awareness into developer tooling, uh, I, that we, we have a chance at fighting that fight. Um, we need to make it easier to write secure software by default. Now, there's a lot of principles about how to do that, and, and in fact, we have some training at the OpenSSF uh, called Devel software development, Secure Software Development Fundamentals. That is about 15, 20 hours of training. It covers kind of the basics of here's common patterns that tend to lead to CVEs, <laughs> things like don't trust user contributed input, and if you do, just don't parse it for format strings, which is what led to one of the things that led to log for shell um, but uh, but doing that is hard uh, and and I while I certainly recommend all of you take that course and certify against it it you know that's not something you can really require every open source developer to do right so try to are there things that we can bake into the tools to make them more efficient in this way um, are there ways that we can reduce the burden on develop on maintainers right um, you've all heard the term going back to the beginning of open source that open source developers uh, it's like this phenomenon that works because everyone is scratching their own itch well, we know that that's not exactly true, right? M many developers are involved in open source because they're solving a problem. They see a bug, they solve that bug, they give the bug fix uh, up uh, to upstream and it solves it for everybody, that's great. They implement a feature everyone can benefit. They work with other people on a, on a new architecture or some refactoring, that's all great. But there's a lot of things that go on 
when it comes to reducing risk in software that are really hard to justify to the higher ups, really hard to get priority uh, time to work on. And you could call it paying off technical debt, but it's doing proactive uh, security reviews of code. It's, it's all the kinds of things that have tended, it's triaging bugs. It's the kind of things that have tended to fall on maintainers uh, uh, and maintainers have limited time to spend on this kind of work. Um, uh, also by getting into the tooling, it allows us to collectively invest into the security of open source uh, communities and the and the ecosystem as a whole. If we can, uh, through the tooling, if we can better automate the adoption of certain practices, then uh, then I think we're all better off. So many of you will know about some of these initiatives, uh, and so I kind of offer them humbly as kind of pointers to more. Uh, and if you if you haven't heard about them, if you haven't uh, getting involved, understanding, and then looking for places to weave them into your tools could be interesting. But the first is SigStore, uh, and and SigStore went general availability back in September. SigStore is about signing artifacts through the software supply chain, uh, attaching a signature, uh, and those signatures being based on keys that are short lived uh, and ephemeral, essentially. And this is very different from the GPG model of signing of artifacts. This is not about maintaining a long-term public-private key pair as a developer that is attached to your email address that you have to roll the key over if it ever gets inadvertently re uh, released. This is about, just like Let's Encrypt, uh, it works because you get a 90-day certificate in an automated way as a kind of a lower trust threshold. Um, I, I, Sigstore has a, a, a component that um, uh, will issue short-lived uh, keys and then when you sign something it'll restore that in a distributed ledger in a log file um, that then is uh, widely available and people can use to, and they can consult to verify the integrity of those signatures um, uh, and and know that the build uh, is traceable back to the developers who publish that code and this solves a problem for repositories where there's not necessarily a provable verifiable link between that package sitting in a repo uh, and the upstream uh, github repo that that was where where that code was developed. Um, uh, this has been widely deployed and adopted now in the cloud native ecosystem, uh, and we're seeing a lot of other ecosystems start to pick it up. A complementary technology, which is a little bit more of a spec. I mean, to be fair, SigStore is both a specification and a, so and, and, and a collection of software uh, and, a, uh, and, a, and a service, this, this, uh, this uh, signature, the, both the key issuer and the, and the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the signature record. Uh, Salsa is more specifically a spec back. Although there is some tooling now uh, that supports this. Salsa stands for uh, uh, security levels for software artifacts. Uh, and this is a, uh, a framework for being able to understand uh, what, were the, uh, what were the attestations about the build environment uh, that, uh, for each of the components uh, as they were assembled through that supply chain. And it's a way to try to meet up what are emerging as regulations in not just in regulated industries like finance and healthcare, but potentially partly as a result of the, of the pushback to uh, the log for shell kind of breach, things that we might ex start to see across uh, all of the software industry uh, in terms of requirements that you have to hit to demonstrate due diligence in building your code in, in a secure way. Now, why does build matter? Uh, uh, you, uh, how many of you remember the, is it a Ken Thompson paper uh, called On Trusting Trust? Is have that right? From 1984, six, something like that from the 1980s? I'm sorry, 19... 86, thank you. Um, on trusting trust, uh, where uh, this is a paper that demonstrated uh, that you could write code all day long that had zero bugs and zero security defects, but if somebody could compromise your compiler, uh, and he demonstrated this by, I believe it was the GCC compiler, uh, uh, building an implementation that could add a backdoor even to code that didn't have that backdoor. So you not only had to trust the code, you have to trust the build tools and the build environment and basically every factor that goes into building that release to really not only have reproducibility but guarantee the integrity. And so we have to think a lot more concretely than uh, a lot more securely than just using kind of random build servers fired off with GitHub Actions, right? Uh, uh, if we really want to have higher integrity and guarantees around uh, the binaries that we're consuming as we build this code. So Salsa is intended to address that. The Salsa specification went 1.0 uh, two weeks ago, uh, and that is the result of a ton of work of people in the OpenSSF community. The Salsa tooling, I believe, is uh, tracks the standard pretty closely. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and 
And the goal is to try to use the tooling to get the standard adopted as widely as possible. And one kind of proof point of this uh, was that last week, I believe it, or the week before, uh, was it last week, GitHub announced um, uh, the uh, uh, adding provenance checks to NPM. And what this means is, and it does require those modules to opt in right now, and this will be an important point I'll make later, um, uh, you can now use a flag to NPM, NPM dash dash provenance to be able to, to, to get a record that shows the, the traceability of each of the modules used in that build back to the source code and back to the developers who wrote uh, those modules. Uh, and this, this is a really cool thing to see. It pulls together SIGStore and Salsa. Um, uh, it doesn't touch on SBOMs yet, I don't think. Um, but GitHub also separately has now enabled a generation of SBOMs, again, as an opt-in kind of thing. Um, and this is great because the NPM community has suffered from the kinds of attacks that this tool is designed to address. Now, this tool is only as good as the numbers of projects that enable it for their module so that, you know, downstream, the, the, the further packages that include it can benefit from that traceability, and also only as good as the pull that comes from the end of it. It also is something we don't want to rush too quickly towards, uh, and Salsa being 1.0 and Sigstore being 1.0 are a nice mark demarcation point that this technology is mature enough for organizations to start pulling in. Um, but, you know, we start to see some regulators out there demanding SBOMs, demanding traceability a bit before some of the technology is ready. So this is great to see in a, in a beta form. It, it, we have to make sure that the community is working on that code, really want it and want to pull it in and have high confidence in it. But what we'd like to see in the long term is more, are more examples of this, more examples where the Python community uh, or the, the, the Rust community or even the Java community through Maven Central or others start to tie together these different technologies technologies into a way that can provide that provable provenance for code um, and along with it bring information about known vulnerabilities, for example, or uh, uh, you know, updated versions uh, or, or other kinds of things that would help developers understand, you know, not only developers understand when they're using uh, 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 code that might be more risky, but also the, you know, the folks managing the build environment and managing, managing risk to get a picture of, of you know, really are, what are we using here. So, so, so the, the overarching picture here is that across those different parts of that life cycle, across source, uh, build, uh, dependencies, packaging, and consumption, there are opportunities to get tooling inserted at each of those stages to have a, a positive impact on the trustworthiness of that code. Um, and again, this is not delivered as gospel. This is delivered uh, as, a, as, a, as a starting point. Would love to see more ideas. And I'm, you know, trying not to avoid, trying to not name like specific technologies and instead try to describe this kind of somewhat generically, right? But I think the key will be getting to specifics and getting this adopted out there in the tool chains of the world. So um, at the, at, I, won't, I won't go through and reach each of these because they do get into some depth, but um, but, uh, uh, but there are opportunities for intervention at each one of these steps. Now, we have a working group inside the OpenSSF uh, called the Security Tooling Working Group. Uh, and, and so far, they've been quite focused on the SBOM uh, question, like how do we drive greater adoptions of software bill of materials for some useful purpose, right, for doing inventory control, inventory uh, uh, kind of tracking is, is a big thing because people didn't know where uh, uh, they were vulnerable to log for j or vulnerable to log for shell uh, vulnerability when that hit. They didn't know when they were done um, because they didn't have a metadata format that allowed them to easily understand where, where in their infrastructures did it lie. They did, in many cases, organizations bought these uh, SCA tools to try to like do forensics to try to understand what's installed where. Um, but forensics is the right term for it. It's like looking for the killer after the, you know, the bodies are decomposed in a way. Like um, having that metadata would be a much uh, uh, more formal way to be able to track that. But there's a lot of other use cases for, for SBOMs, security-related use cases for, for SBOMs uh, in, 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 the, in the supply chain. Uh, among them, to track vulnerable dependencies and uh, outstanding CVEs that have not been addressed. Oh, that's a pretty dynamic data set, so it's less metadata in the package and more something that's attached on it as it goes through the uh, system. There are others who are looking for use cases around capabilities. You know, here's a package, and this package should never open a network connection to anything other than known good IP address or something. 
something, right, uh, as a way to, to audit uh, the infrastructure and, and, and attach that to, you know, network monitoring tools and the like, that could be pretty powerful. So lots of good ideas, but until we have this, this ubiquitous uh, kind of metadata structure for carrying this kind of information uh, through, uh, it's really hard to get to that. And so the Security Tooling Working Group has been talking quite a bit about that, uh, which we've categorized as kind of SBOM everywhere, uh, uh, and there's a, a SIG focused on that, but it's kind of embedded inside the working group. Um, they also developed a guide to security tools uh, that really is where many of these ideas came from that are, is worth diving into a little bit more and thinking about ways to, to weave those into your development processes. Uh, they've developed uh, uh, something called the CVE benchmark, which is uh, code and metadata for over 200 real life CVEs, as well as tooling to kind of analyze them using a variety of static analysis tools. Um, so, so to try to just look at those as templates for where there might be similar bugs uh, throughout the rest of, of the, your code and, and others. It's also where we focused on uh, some of the fuzzing work uh, that's gone on in the open SSF, uh, uh, and including a fuzz introspector tool that uh, Google open sourced through us to, to help drive fuzzing as a more standard part of the software development process. Um, in fact, uh, uh, the fuzzing, fuzz testing is also one of those things the security scorecards look for. If you include those tools and you show that you're making some reasonable use of them, your score on the scorecard improves. Uh, it's just, even if you've implemented everything in a memory safe language, uh, uh, there's still the opportunity, that f the possibility, uh, Jonathan, I, I'm going to confirm this with you, like, like fuzz tooling still makes sense for something like Rust and Go. Uh, I <laughs> Jonathan's not a fuzzer. He's not the right person to ask. Okay. Well, um, somebody correct me if that if I'm wrong on that. But um, I, but I think even even still with memory safe languages, there's the opportunity that you've incorrectly used uh, uh, memory memory in a way that fuzz testing might surface. Yeah. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention um, that in the Alpha Omega project, uh, 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 in which, by the way, Jonathan works, as does Yesenia sitting over here, um, they, one of the things that we've developed is a, something called the analysis tool chain, which is it's a, it's a toolkit for identifying vulnerabilities in critical open source projects. Uh, it's, uh, it's automated. It's something you could plug into a development work stream. Uh, but it's, it's the beginning of what we hope is a framework for, for just more rigorous kind of interrogation of code. It's not quite fair to call it a static analysis tool, I don't think. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the analysis tool chain, is, what, what would be the better term to describe it? Really? <laughs> right. Right. So it's just to try to get that kind of analysis uh, to be something that, that open source projects do more, uh, more often, more in a more systematic way. So I, I do check that out as well. Um, where are things head in the future? I mean, this is a little bit more kind of blue sky stuff. So um, I, I, you know, just this, and, and I do want to talk about a frame of reference that I have in my mind about how these kinds of tools get adopted out there um, that provides perhaps some insight to this, which is um, <clears throat> I compare this to the way that TLS uh, was adopted across the web ecosystem over the last 20 years. Um, so uh, it has to start with carrots. Right uh, when the web was unencrypted again, or when email was unencrypted, or all that kind of stuff, there was really no incentive for people to go the extra mile, um, unless you were like a bank and you're trying to convince people they could open a, a bank account and you could keep their their account details secure. Um, uh, but to consumers, that was like the web was either secure or not secure. It was when they realized, oh, we should probably add kind of a green highlight at the at the URL bar for those sites that are using TLS, and so that they can reassure consumers and get some extra kind of benefit from doing that, right? So there had to be a carrot to using TLS in the early days. Uh, and, and that carrot was kind of this projection of increased trust to the consumer. But at a certain point, if you really want to, if your goal is to get the web to become entirely encrypted, you need to move beyond offering those incentives and, and making them the, you know, kind of the exceptional case to now becoming the default, to getting them Im, uh, embedded inside of the standards. And, and, and there I would point to like, let's encrypt. Once Let's Encrypt automated the process of uh, when you install a web server, any web server, um, automated going and getting a 90-day uh, certificate for it, uh, and then and then updating that on a regular basis, uh, that allowed every new website from that point forward, <laughs> essentially, to be to be secure and and moved it from being the exception to being the rule. 
Um, but there's still that final stage of <clears throat> either those pro those websites that had been set up prior to Let's Encrypt uh, or the, the the folks who were just kind of slow in the game uh, to adopting it. I, I and and if it you know the the unencrypted web still represents a threat out there, then you really want to uh, uh, deploy a set of sticks. And my example there is how in many web browsers today, if you try to access an unencrypted website, you'll get a little bit of a warning. You know, the URL bar might turn red. I think different web browsers take different approaches. Um, they'll still let you access it. It's not that they've been banned, but it's it, there's, a, there's a fair bit of friction and a fair bit of warning uh, adopted in that. And I think when we think about how to get uh, security tooling adopted uh, across the uh, across the developer landscape, Nobody proactively wants to go out and 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 uh, take on additional steps, take on additional burdens. I, I, if it slows them from being able to to add, fix the bugs and add the features that they need to do in order to be able to go home for the day, right? Uh, uh, security should be somebody else's problem. It should be something that we pay other people to do. Well, getting it into not just into the tooling but adopted as a cultural thing depends upon these three phases. And by the way, not stepping ahead to sticks, which is where some of the regulations we were are heading today. Um, the re some of the regulations, especially in Europe, are starting to call for publishing of SBOMs, publishing of your you know, provenance, and, and, and even getting third-party audits for that kind of thing, which is interesting and cool, but could, by being pushed too quickly to sticks, uh, drive a lot of bad technology, a lot of bad adoption out there. So, so in thinking about that kind of approach, um, one thing that we think we're ready for at the OpenSSF is to dive a little bit more into this concept of a sterling tool chain, which is kind of a misnomer. I, uh, the word meta tool chain might just be too meta for some people, um, but because it, it's really not about like one true way to build co software or one true one true system for building software, but instead saying there's a collection of components and standards and processes that have tended to lead to more secure software by default, right? And we have a lot of the pieces out there, and and some of the glue has really emerged for that. And I think S bombs are a form of glue for these processes. Um, and you could point to SigStore and Salsa as examples of these, but um, there are a bunch of others that need to come through. Even something like Security Scorecard could be worked in. You know, in an early part of the dev process, if you warn a developer that they're trying to include a dependency that scores pretty poorly on the Security Scorecard, you might want to flash, you know, yellow or, or red at them, right? Um, so can we pull these different pieces together into something that looks like a model for um, how we would want the uh, other language ecosystems to adopt these tools um, and down to not just just use SBOMs, but use this particular profile of SBOMs, use them with this particular data set, that kind of thing, and that ties to SIGSTAR. Like, get as specific as possible so that you can get as simple as possible. Uh, try to avoid the temptation to provide support for five different ways to do the same thing, which is something we all cherish in open source ever since Perl. <laughs> Perl had this, you know, there's always another way to do it kind of motto, um, and we love in open source to have yet another way to, to do something. But, but this is a little bit more like, can we come to, together to do something cohesive, minimally viable, um, but uh, simp as simple as possible to, to drive better uh, security throughout, not just the upstream language ecosystems in open source, but also downstream into the companies that are adopting uh, uh, these that, that need that kind of traceability, even into their own internal apps or into the proprietary software that they go off and ship. Something like 70 to 90% of the code that's in a software, typical software product, whether that's inside of a car or a phone or an enterprise server, something like 70 to 90 percent of it is pre-existing open source code uh, and having that traceability upstream and through that even as you go downstream to deploy it into your production servers that's the kind of thing we need and if every language ecosystem adopts a different way of doing it you know all of these heterogeneous end user kind of systems we build are going to be incredibly confused uh, so working together across these language ecosystems to adopt some common standards and approaches for this is really what what this is about and trying to, as a result, end up with more trustworthy software through the chain and especially at the end of the chain, uh, benefiting all of us. There's some other areas that I think are complementary to this that are worth highlighting as both risks but also opportunities. Uh, and it, you know, I would be remiss if giving a presentation in the second quarter of 2023 if I didn't mention AI or ChatGPT somewhere, which I did purge from this deck. Uh, but you know, um, but but I think there's an opportunity to use uh, AI tooling in the supply chain uh, to not only get us to be smarter about the potential risks, uh, potentially as well to use in the scanning of code. 
Um, I'm kind of skeptical about that because AI tends to be a little bit more based on good enough answers, whereas security ho holes in particular tend to be about <laughs> specific off by one kind of semantic errors, right? So we'll see, but there are some projects out there that have reported some, some good uh, results from trying to apply uh, machine learning to software analysis. So let's see. I'm also really worried about, look, so many of our processes in the open source world are, are social processes, right? Who we grant uh, access to uh, become a maintainer on our open source project is often based on building a trust over time with somebody that you think is human, <laughs> with, with uh, somebody on the other side of, an, uh, of a GitHub ID who um, you kind of have been trained not to care where they come from, and I think that's good. You've been trained not to care about their credentials, right? You might be, care if they're on other open source projects. That's a good thing. Um, but not whether they're a PhD or a college or, or you know, a 16-year-old. That's, that's fine, right? But, um, but we've set up these high trust processes, uh, at a, at a, and, and there's some vulnerability that could come from using large language models to try to attack those systems. And I'd love to believe there's a counter use of, of, of AI to kind of shield us against what, I don't know, you'd call like, uh, there's got to be a new term. It's like catfishing, but, but for software, uh, <laughs> you know, where, where an attacker would try to create fake profiles to go and gain the trust of key projects, get themselves in as maintainers, and then slip in vulnerabilities that way. Um, and I'd like to figure out how we might use uh, those kinds of tools to counter those new kinds of risks. And then secondly, um, so much of the what we're dealing with here is in the form of, of text mode <laughs> kinds of tools for verifying signatures, for getting getting here's your JSON file with your long provenance in it, right? But that's going to be really hard to build into in, you know, smart systems. Uh, and there are a bunch of vendors building interesting dashboards to try to visualize the software development process. Uh, there's a, 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 a talk by Anova. Um, she was the uh, visual, visualizer uh, yesterday on the panel at OpenSSF uh, starting at 11.55 today, where she's going to talk about some work she's done trying to visualize the software development lifecycle and, 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 secu and security issues in that. Um, so that's just after this. I think in this room it might be in the next room over. Um, uh, but we've kind of done generally a poor job of visualizing where that risk is in, in the supply chain and in an installed system. I want to make it so that with all of the both objective and subjective data that we can collect about the state of this chain, we can find the next log for J. Right, because uh, really, those developers—they were professional developers. You know, they were using Log4j for production systems in their own environments. They were under-resourced, but I've never met an open-source project that have said, "No, no, we have too many resources, <laughs> uh, too many developers." Right? Um, uh, they had, the, but they were also responsible for a tremendous amount of code, including a whole stretch that had been donated to them years earlier and not really maintained, to do things like substitute variables in the real, real world, real-time processing of log log files that you could argue probably didn't, shouldn't have even been, you know, something you'd had in Log4j. That's a post-processing kind of thing. Regardless, like, um, what we all failed at doing, what we all did was we took it for granted. We all took Log4j for granted and, and the idea that so security was somebody else's problem. If we'd had a dashboard that showed us you know, there hasn't ever been a third-party code review of Log4j. Uh, or, you know, there are substantial stretches of code without test coverage. Uh, or, I, I, you know, other indicators of either community health or process health or other things. Maybe we won't, probably won't be able to find the next one that's going to be the problem. But if we could find the next hundred, collectively we could demonstrate to our pointy-haired bosses, <laughs> you know, here's a risk area. And if we all collectively chipped in to fund a third-party audit, we'd bring that from a green to a yellow and suddenly Suddenly, your, your enterprise risk scores would go down, and we'd all be heroes, right? That's what we could get through better dashboarding, is better collective sense making and a better uh, opportunity to identify these forgotten kinds of projects, these under resourced projects who, through no fault of their own, could in inadvertently become the next, uh, the next source of a major breach. So that's what I'd love to see us head to when it comes to tooling, is understanding that. Um, uh, but this is just the slide where I say there are still not enough eyeballs uh, in open source. Uh, you know, that, that general statement that uh, with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, if that was ever true, and maybe for a few projects out there, that's true that they have enough eyeballs per line of code, which is the qualifier there, per line of code. Um, I, I, that's the case, but we simply don't. And having tooling that can help us augment what has been a very social process up to date would be incredibly helpful. So if any of this resonates with you all, 
all. And like I said, I want to be kind of humble. This this doc is a starting point. Think of this as that embarrassing Wikipedia page that you just feel compelled to come in and edit and stay up all night to do so. Um, I, I, I we would love some feedback on this. This is this represents some emerging work in the open SSF. So we'd really love you to come in and help with that. Um, but also in like charter and crafting this uh, this vision of how these tools work together and how we how do we build them in such a way that the other tool chain and uh, language ecosystems want to adopt them. I would love your help on that. So there's a, obviously on the specific working groups and projects, there's ways to get involved on those. Um, uh, happy to point you to them. Um, the, the security tooling working group is the one that I might point to as the, the kind of broader place where I'm hoping these conversations take place more. Um, on Alpha Omega, we have uh, the uh, security tool chain is, of course, all open source and has its own uh, kind of community emerging around it. But I uh, would love to see all of you involved in this conversation. And um, if you all are connected to these tool chain communities, I uh, would love your, your guidance on how we start those conversations about getting them adopted. And with that, uh, uh, there's a bunch of ways to participate. This will be links in the deck uh, attached to the SCED uh, as soon as I sit down and upload it. Um, but would love to see you all on Slack or, or, or on, on Zoom sometime soon. Uh, and with that, I think I've got some time for questions or comments or thoughts. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's give due credit to the licensing and conformance community, which sounds like a really weird thing to say. But uh, let's do give due credit to the licensing and conformance community for having uh, first raised the importance of tracing traceability and, and metadata through the software development process. Because it's been, uh, but for the fear of the GPL contaminating your uh, your commercial project, we now have a system um, to be able to reassure your 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 legal counsels and others that no trust we, we've only got good open source code uh, when we don't have any like inadvertent proprietary code as well in this bundle that we can collectively say is appropriately licensed. Um, and that drove a lot of the work at SPDX, like do credit there, uh, and, uh, I, I, and, and development of some tooling for managing that, although a lot of that tooling is proprietary, which I think is one thing that's, that's there's a lot of open source code too, but, uh, but uh, let's... Uh, Okay, great, good, good. That's uh, I, 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 I'm doing collective sense making here, and that is a very strong voice that is different from other voices out there. And we have to help educate them about the tooling that's available. So that is great to hear, and I think it'll also make sense when these things are woven together, and SBOM becomes the vehicle for carrying a lot of this data between other tools. So um, uh, let's let's follow up on that in particular. But Open Chain is a pro another project actually at the LF that has had success in in deploying SBOMs in this way for the licensing and conformance use case. Uh, and um, I do think like working together on SPDX in particular is a way to close that gap, uh, uh, driving the adoption of that tooling you mentioned for conformance into the security use cases. So that's where, I mean, SPDX 3.0, the, uh, the release candidate for that was just announced last week, um, and it has security profiles which I think a lot of folks have been waiting on in order to, before they start building code that talks an emerging standard, that's yeah, some risk there, right? So now that that's trending towards close, I think you'll see more tools development for the security use cases. So that's good. And yeah, and we just uh, need uh, you all to spend more time on our project and us to spend more time on your project and close that gap um, and try to avoid duplication of effort. I, I, I know in open source we're famous for like wanting to you know see three different ways to solve the same problem, but security isn't assisted by that. Optionality has a cost, and and I think you know there's a lot of times we work on different things when we really only disagree on some fine things that could be made runtime variables. <laughs> so um, so we'll, I'll, 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 Shane and I talk a lot, and and we'll figure out how to bring our projects closer together. Uh, and I think we're at time. Oh no, time for one more. Sure.
So there's a lot of excitement about SBOMs, uh, and, and some folks have called for developing repositories of SBOM data. Uh, obviously, at the tail end of a, of a production process, you have like all the SBOMs for upstream right there locally. Your question was, do we th how do we think companies are going to slice and dice that data to try to understand it? Yeah? What? No, no, no. Uh, so, so the question was, just to repeat for everyone else, will the um, open source tooling replace the need for kind of collecting the, that SBOM data and trying to understand it and, 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 and digest it? And certainly, I don't see the answers yes to that. I think, I think this, these systems will depend upon metadata, you know, being attached to objects as they flow through the supply chain. And SBOM, the, the, the different SBOM formats, you know, uh, SPDX in particular, I think, could be a container for that metadata. And that container can be firmly attached to the object by the publisher, right? Right? But adding additional SBOMs to that by somebody who notices, hey, there's an outstanding CVE, you know, uh, then we should add a, that's one of the security profile features, right? You add that as an additional SBOM to that package as it keeps going. Uh, or um, this new thing called OpenVex, which is a way for software publishers to say, we know we haven't fixed this vulnerability and this dependency, but we're not affected by it because we don't use something that it triggers. I mean, you should be able to attach that as well. So SBOM data is going to be pretty dynamic. Then there'll be some of it that is static and attached to code, but also it'll evolve as it goes through the uh, uh, system. And every company will have a repository that says, here's all the places that, according to the SBOM data, say you're using Log4j, <laughs> that you need to go and close, close up until, before you can call the problem solved, right? Um, I do also think we'll see global repositories of SBOM data for open source projects, uh, potentially even for non-open source projects, where they serve as, you know, as a search engine, right? As, a, as an analytics tool as a way to understand globally who out there is dependent upon a version of log4j before version before one of the fixed versions, right? To try to uh, top-down kind of like address these issues rather than purely bottoms up. Um, and no one's yet proposed that we do that, but I don't think we'd be opposed uh, to the idea. Who did? Okay. And it's called Ocelot? Okay, great. Um, uh, we need you to start. Uh, get, we, this is the like. This is how we close the gap: is getting more of the folks from the licensing and conformance community into uh, help us understand what's already there and can be leveraged. That'd be great. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well. Um, oh, well, one more question. I'm sorry if I if uh, begging everyone's forgiveness. Yep. Yeah. Well, the output of these tools will be signatures you can verify. There'll be JSON files that you can you can present as you know either testimony or even in some cases proof that you've achieved levels of conformance. That's what Salsa is about, so that you could say here's you know everything self-attested through this chain has hit Salsa level three or Salsa level four. They'll, and there is a certification process and regime that folks are talking about setting up to have auditors who will be trained in this who be able to say yes, as a third party, we can attest we witness that that level of conformance was hit. And so they, those kinds of groups will consume this data and then verify the, that the real world matches what the attestation is. Um, uh, but I predict like that the base level command line tools to basically go, everything is, is cool, that you'll weave into your CI CD pipeline. And, and, and so bad stuff won't even make it to, to, you know, prod, you know, let alone test, right? So I, I, I think, I think that's how they eventually will get in. These days, if you want to go, it is at the command line level, but, um, but I think we'll see that shift over the next year to being something more more visually appealing and integrated into the tools themselves. And with that, uh, thank you all so much.